Hello everyone, today is a bit of an unusual video. I am going to give you an opportunity to get a glimpse into a behind the scenes of a podcast that I'm doing. Uh, I'm being interviewed by Self Made Strategies Podcast and I'll link all their information below. And I'm waiting on a gentleman by the name of Tony Lopes and Mike Leary to be here probably in about a few minutes. They're gonna set up the whole podcast things right inside my office and we're gonna talk about uh, me, I guess, and, uh, and anything that pertains to being self-made. Tony's and Mike's mission is to help entrepreneurs get them together, get great advice firsthand from those that have done something with their life that have made a successful business in hopes that by sharing this type of information among successful people or those trying to be more successful, that that will bring a lot of light into the world of business and to the world. It's a kick-ass podcast. I've listened to it a few times. Lots of interesting information, lots of interesting people come on there, such as myself, to be modest. And uh, But other than that, you guys definitely check it out. Again, I'll link it all below, and uh, I'm going to wait for these guys to get here, and uh, we'll move forward. Hey, come in, guys. Hey, hey, how are you, man? How are you? Good to see you. How's it going? Hey, come on how in. You, nice you guys need help with any of this stuff? Some people good. All right, so we're going to set this up here. Got it. Let's get it all settled, and then uh, let's, let's do it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Self-Made Strategies Podcast. I am your host, Tony Lopes, and with me today is guest co-host Michael Leary, the head honcho over at 115 Films. Hey, Mike. How you doing, Tony? How's it going? Great, Good. great. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks for being here to co-host. And today we have an amazing guest who really needs no introduction, but we're going to play his introduction for you right here. This is a refugee story. My dad brought us here to chase the American dream. It all started in a 400 square foot apartment in Brooklyn, New York. When I turned 18, I joined the US Army. Post the Army in college, I thought I made it. A VP at a Fortune 500 company at the age of 26. And at the peak of my career, I walked away to follow my dream. Today at Luxury Bazaar, we have 40 employees, a 25,000 square foot location, and over 100 million sales a year. My partners and I have been all over the world. I started this channel to give you a glimpse into my life as the founder and CEO of Luxury Bazaar and to talk about my passion for watches. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's On My Desk. And I always tell you how it is. This shit ain't gonna last forever either. It's selling like hotcakes and they're trading way over list. Absolutely insane right now. Though I always say watches are not an investment. This is again my opinion. Every Tuesday I will answer all of your questions. Here's a good question for, I'm not an expert on watches, but thoughts on brands like Vanford or T-Black? Seems like people just buy unoriginal, well-known, expensive shit. Interesting question. We always try to give back. I'm looking for a bit of $8,000, $8,000 in the room, and I got a bit of 85. We work hard, and we play hard. But at the end, it's all about family. This is a refugee story. My dad brought us here chasing the American dream. This is my American dream. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition. So there you go. That's Roman Scharf in a uh, in a nutshell. Hey, Roman, how are you? Hey, guys, how are you? Thanks for having me. Great, Absolutely. great. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. And Roman is the very, very busy founder and CEO of Luxury Bazaar. Uh, tell us a little bit about Luxury Bazaar, Roman. So we're an online portal for luxury products. Originally started with watches and then moved on to other things like jewelry, luxury accessories, etc. Mm-hmm. Sort of a flea market for high-end goods, if you will. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and so we'll, we'll kick off the show and talk a little bit more about how you got into Luxury Bazaar, how you, you came into this, so to speak. But give us a little bit about your background. You were with a, a Fortune, Fortune 500 company, Deutsche Bank, correct? Mm, that is correct. I guess it goes back a little while prior to that. Uh, my parents brought me to this country as a refugee at the age of 13. My dad came here with about $4 in his pocket and uh, grew up uh, not rich, I guess you can put a lack of a better word. Uh, we grew up in a 400 square foot apartment in Brooklyn, New York. My wow. father got a job in Philadelphia. We moved up here. Fast forward post high school, I decided to join the Army because I believe uh, most people should. Uh, post the Army, I got into electrical engineering and computer science, which was what I studied at Penn State. And after a couple of jobs, I ended up at Deutsche Bank, traveled about four hours each way to New York City. Pretty wow. demanding job. 
the man that I work, I give or take 26 hours a day. I run the, <laughs> I ran the infrastructure support for the global payment systems, about $40 wow. billion dollars a month in transactions. So needless to say, I was on call 25-7 instead of 24-7. Wow. Uh, started the watch thing part-time. eBay was coming around and uh, uh, people were telling me, you're nuts. You're going to be selling $10,000 watches on eBay. Who the hell is going to buy them? And as they say, the rest is history. So here we are today. Yeah, what are you doing mm -hmm. annual revenue these uh, days? Uh, last year, we did just north of $113 million. Ooh, <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And it's expanded, right? I should let you take that from there, actually. Sorry, Michael, okay. jump in with the first question. All right, cool. So, Roman, let's start with Luxury Bazaar and where it is now. You now have a 25,000-square-foot location and 40 employees and a huge following on YouTube. You have also expanded to more than just watches, including estate jewelry and antique jewelry. What are your new product lines, and are there any plans for additional growth coming up? There are. We actually have uh, big plans. Uh, we decided to expand our platforms, as you will. Outside of LuxuryBazaar.com being our main platform and our mm -hmm. website, we expanded to other huge platforms. It's extremely difficult to uh, compete with some of the big boys. So rather than competing with them, we decided to work with them. So you'll find Luxury Bazaar products across multiple platforms now. LuxuryBazaar.com, eBay, Overstock, Amazon, First Dibs, Rule A Lot, Guild, multiple flashlights. Right. StockX, believe it or not, StockX got into the watch game. We're wow. on there as well. So anytime we see... a uh, upcoming or already a big platform out there that has the ability to sell our products, we jump in and sort of partner with them. Uh, to do that, of course, we had to lower our product line. Uh, our average ticket price used to be at around $15,000, and now it's gone down under the $500 mark because it's a lot easier to sell a $200 watch or, or $150 pair of earrings than it is a $150,000 necklace or a watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're just diversifying more within the same realm. It's all brand oriented still. So we do deal with brand names for the most part. And the idea is that we provide a brand name at a level you can afford, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to cost thousands of dollars. That's awesome. That's great. And so you carry everything from IWCs. I'm a little bit of a watch snob, just right. entry-level okay. watch okay. snob, okay. let's say. We'll, we'll talk about that after the, po <laughs> the podcast. <laughs> so you carry everything, though. IWCs, Omegas, Audemars, everything. It's uh, it can go from a million and a half dollar watch down to a one hundred dollar watch. Wow. So just wow. because uh, Calvin Klein doesn't necessarily make a hundred thousand dollar watches mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's not a name. It's still a big brand name. It's recognizable. Uh, but uh, if I start spitting out brand names, we'll be here for a while. But uh, <laughs> you, you, you touched upon about 4% of what we carry. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm yeah. wearing my uh, daily Omega Speedmaster uh, triple date automatic. I'm a gift, big Omega fan. Gift so. from the wife, my but favorite. I'm a huge Omega fan, yeah. especially the NASA stuff. So Yeah, yeah. I have the, uh, we were talking about this before we, we got on the air when we talked on the phone originally, that I my wife bought me an Apollo 17, uh, Apollo Apollo 17, 40th anniversary, the one with the sterling silver, which and you have for sale. To, I actually happen to have one downstairs <laughs> in my home. Nice. It's, it's a limited a cool, edition a cool watch. watch. Yeah, it's, a cool it's an watch. awesome watch. It's, a, it's, it's my favorite piece, but I, I tend not to wear it because, one, because she got me the Speedmaster, but also because um, the moon watch is kind of special to me because... Because it's I'll, an I'll tell you a, secret. a wedding gift. Watches are meant to be worn, so don't keep it in the safe. <laughs> yeah, <where laughs> yeah that's it. that's a good point. Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in that as well. If you have something nice, you should use it, right? Or else, what's yep. the point? But, exactly. Sure. But how one of, one of the questions that that I have and that I found most admirable about the way that you've built Luxury Bazaar is that you focused even from day one, very early on, on a uh, high high level of customer service. How did you ensure that that you maintain that as you were growing so rapidly? Because in a short five years, you had 20 employees and 33 million a year in revenue. You were off to more than the races for sure. It was probably one of the most difficult things because the nature of the beast is so personal. Right. I am not, I was, at, when I started, I was selling expensive goods exclusively. I didn't sell jewelry. I only sold watches and expensive watches mm -hmm. at that. Having been uh, a basement operation for say, right, and everything was in my cell phone. Till this day, I mm. still have clients that call my cell phone. They will not talk wow. to anyone else. So it was extremely difficult to let go, not to micromanage. Right. Once I uh, took on new salespeople, once I took on new staff and customer service, it was extremely difficult. And the worst part was is when I'm busy 24-7 and there's a client that wants to call in and speak with you and only you and he doesn't want to talk to your client. And i got to be honest, I've lost a few clients along the way because of that. Wow. But for those that understood growth, for those that understood what I was trying to do, that I'm, again, not a one-man operation already, they kind of, they went with it. And uh, mm -hmm. there were mistakes. 
And the thing was, listen, you have to find a uh, reasonable or acceptable margin of error, mm -hmm. you know, because a new salesman coming on is not often as knowledgeable about watches. In fact, I wasn't as knowledgeable back then as I am today, obviously. Right. But that was probably the most difficult thing to do. Uh, and I did lose some clients along the way, but I gained many more just the same. So yep. it worked wow. out. Yeah. And yeah, so w do you have any tips or advice about for people who are, their business is growing, they need to hire new employees, they can't continue to your point to do everything, right? Which is really a tough part of letting go as your business is growing. <laughs> He's smiling. I know my wife is the same thing. I mean, mm -hmm. at home, she's like, you know, she has great employees, but she's growing and she's trying to figure out, you know, those growing pains. How do you get past that? Micromanagement mm -hmm. is a uh, buzzword that everybody hears. And it's, it's the toughest thing to say, oh, I'm not going to micromanage. It's easier said than done. Right. My one advice to everyone is to do what I did. And uh, I followed uh, my old military experience. In the military, we have a term called SOP, which is called st Standard Operating Procedure, right? Mm -hmm. I was a forward observer or a scout in the military. So for everything that we did, for everything that I did as a scout, there was an SOP. Whether it was classifying bridges, calling artillery, or shooting somebody in the head, once, one way or the other, there was a standard operating procedure. Well, maybe not the last one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I've done is I sat down, uh, I realized early on, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So as you grow in a department, as you bring it on a new department, let's say, or a new person or anything that's new to you. If you don't know how to do it within your own business, then you cannot rely on others to do it for mm -hmm. you. If you want something done, do it yourself. So you do that not by actually physically doing a lot of this stuff. Well, most instances you do, but you, correct, you come up with a procedure and you literally write out a document. If you walk over to my COO's office, Vladimir is not here right now, you'll notice a bunch of binders and those are all SOPs. So mm -hmm. down from shipping, receiving, quality control, buying, selling, uh, sending emails. There were every single email was pre-formatted. I probably wrote 19 different emails for customer service myself to tell them, look, if the guy asks this, tell him that. And then you let your people run with the procedures that you set in place. However, mm -hmm. there's one thing to run a tight ship, but there's another thing to give people opportunity. And the biggest trick to writing a standard operating procedure is to allow the people that work for you to modify it. They first have to learn it. The first, thing, the first thing they need to do is do it the way you want it done and the way you do it. As long as you can get past that and they can get that 100%, or let's say within an acceptable margin of error, as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. then you allow them the opportunity to, to add to that, to modify that procedure based on the experience they have gained. Mm -hmm. And I urge every single one of my employees from the time that I hire them and, and I hand them that book and say, this is what you got to do from A to Z and these are the buttons to press, that I need you to come back to me once you learn all this and tell me how I can make this better. Mm -hmm. It gives the employee the opportunity to shine, Smart. to move forward, to move ahead. Uh, and at the same token, I don't claim to be the best in everything that I do. I'm an engineer by trade, you know? So when it comes to video editing, or what do I know about that? Or photography, or any of that. But I do know the results that I want. So as long as you have a procedure in place and the people that follow your procedures have the opportunity to embed it, then you're good to go. That seems, you know, that also makes it seem like they would, uh, they would appreciate that very much because it shows that you trust them to oh, bring, absolutely. To bring their, their A game. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And so I just also wanted to touch on you, you not only started with an ad value first philosophy for the business, which by the way is phenomenal. You also started with a philosophy that was based on educating your client, right? I was lucky enough and I wish I could uh, claim this for my own, but I was lucky enough to find a client whose name was Gregory. At the time, we're going back probably almost uh, 15 years now. Uh, he called me up, we talked on the phone, and he asked me a bunch of questions about watches. And it's, the phone call seemed funny to me because this guy was asking more questions than usual. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I, your encyclopedia on watches? And uh, we're going back and <laughs> forth, and he's asking me all this. Then I found out who he was. At the time, going back, you know, before podcast technology and YouTube right. and all that stuff, if you guys remember, there were good old seminars for marketing. And there were CDs that guys put out to give you marketing techniques and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what this guy did for a living. So this guy did seminars in front of thousands of people. He put out uh, CDs that I listened to. It was a six, I still have it somewhere actually. I don't have a CD player, but I have that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it was a six uh, disc set that talked about marketing strategies. Mm. And he told me, it's like, Roman, I'm gonna give you some free advice and I want you to follow it. Uh, you must, first and foremost, educate your consumer. And I'm like, why? He's like, because when you educate your consumer, you have to leave him feeling stupid if he goes elsewhere and only buy from you regardless of price. And that's stuck with me for a while. Mm. So the one thing I 
always, always done is I've always taken my time talking to clients, telling them what they're buying, explaining to them, you know, what they're looking for, listening to them. What are you looking for in the watch and so on and so forth. I would then in turn educate them and there was never a sales pitch there. But guess what? Every single client, whether it was on that phone call right there and then or a phone call later, came back and wanted to buy from me and only me regardless of price. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes a difference. And I, I agree with you. I agree with that school of thought. I'm a little bit of a self-taught mar marketing nerd. Um, listening to marketing audiobooks nowadays, no more CDs, as no more you CDs. said, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I spend a lot of time, you know, kind of learning it. And that's kind of how I got into podcasting was the same thing, similar to your video concept. It was a means to educate people, to become a knowledge center. But also I, I deep dove into it and was just listening to every podcast book I could, listening to every marketing book I you could. Meet my CMO, that's all he does. <laughs> <24 seconds. laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. It's really great to, to hear and to meet somebody who, with that mentality. Cool. Your advertising and marketing client told you to educate your client first. Is that how, why you began your YouTube channel? Uh, yes, for the most part. But uh, YouTube channel is something that uh, came to us uh, via mutual friends. You guys know, those guys know Lance from 1SEO. I think mm -hmm. he just yeah. did a podcast yep. with him. Yep. Right. Yep. He kept screaming, Roman, with your company needs a face, your company needs a face. All this knowledge and experience you have, you need to share it with people via video because that's the latest and the greatest. Mm -hmm. I went on to the YouTube space and I listened to some of the watch guys out there. And I'm not going to drop any names. And I was less than impressed. Majority of these videos were geared towards marketing and only marketing and mostly geared towards selling a product. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side of the videos were geared towards getting views and subscribers and getting ad revenue from back from YouTube. These were guys that were not in the business. And some of the stuff they were saying was just out of nonsense. And I listened to all the stuff. I'm like, you know what? I'll make you a deal. And I spoke both to Lance and my CMO, Avi. And I told him, I said, I'll do this. But I'm only going to do this on my terms, and that is going to be telling it like it is. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I hear my subscribers talking about, uh, wow, nobody really tells it like this. Well, it's because I don't really have a hidden agenda behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But what has happened, and I'm not going to lie about this, ever since I've gotten on YouTube, sales started coming in from YouTube. Because people are now listening to me, getting educated at the same time, and they're wanting to buy from me and only me. And it's going back to 15 years ago before YouTube was there or before uh, when we had to listen to CDs. It's the same exact concept. Right. I just wanted to make sure that when I am on YouTube that I am indeed genuine. That's why I don't practice for anything. All my Q&As and any video that I do, I do it off the top of my head. I literally read the question. I answer it off the top of my head. Of course, yeah. Ian puts in yeah. some creative editing in there. And when I <laughs> slip a few wrong words, you'll cut them out and so on and so forth. But for the most part... It's the same exact concept, but up to the times. Yeah, it's much nat more natural delivery exactly. in that way. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So what advice do you have for other entrepreneurs who are looking to grow their brand by educating their clients in a similar fashion? Today, it's, uh, it comes down to the three Cs. Uh, creative content consistently. Do you guys know who said that? No. I did. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I like and I, it. And I, talk, and I talked about this uh, with Avi and so on and so forth. Creative content consistently. Today... Stay in age, clientele out there, regardless of what you're selling, whether it's a service or a product or yourself, it doesn't really matter. They want to see creative content and they want to see it consistently. Uh, Casey Neistat, arguably one of the famous, most famous YouTubers out there, guy I watch consistently. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for his next video to come out. It's like binging a Netflix series or something <laughs> like that, right? Uh, and all this guy just talks about his life. He doesn't really sell any type of product, so he kind of sells himself, right? Uh, his content is creative. When you watch this video, the visuals, the way the videos are edited and everything else. And his content always has a story. Story is the most important. Yeah. If this mm -hmm. podcast didn't have a story of what we're currently talking about, people would get bored, start yawning, and yeah. turn it off. Yeah. So story is a big part of the content. The delivery, the creativity of the content, and mm -hmm. consistency. Consistency is key. Today, now, now day and age, it's not no longer a uh, TV ad or a newspaper ad. It's social media, right? Mm -hmm. Social media is king today, and that's Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Yeah. You want to stay in your client's face with creative content, and you want to be consistent about it so that they're looking forward to the next piece of content coming from you. Yeah. And that's really the trick, I feel like. That's brilliant. That's yeah. great advice, I think. And, and you do have to be everywhere nowadays. It's not enough to be in one medium focused, right? We were just talking about Instagram before we before we started recording and it's it's impossible to focus on literally one medium. You're putting your eggs in all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. Essentially. And putting your eggs in one basket is the worst. And uh, A, you're not in control. Tomorrow Instagram may decide that your content uh, doesn't follow their leader. Yeah, Somebody makes right. one too many complaints and you're out. And mm -hmm. there goes your whole plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 
it is being everywhere, but at the same token, figuring out what's most effective. So, yeah. so in our case, in case of e-commerce, for example, uh, the biggest thing that we look for in uh, analytics is we'll look at the, and obvious behind me, what's the the map as to how, to, as to how people get to us? What is that called? The uh, the conversions, uh, where are you converting right. from? What are the right. touch points? That's it. Touch I was looking for the word touch points. <laughs> what are the touch points? So a guy came to my website and he bought a ring or he bought a watch. Well, where did it come from? Well, the last touch was from an email. But for us, we dig much deeper and we see, okay, well, wait a minute. What are all the touch points? Well, this guy went on his YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Then he went, saw a Facebook ad. Then he saw a retargeting ad. Then he saw an email. Then finally, from the last Facebook ad, he decided to come to the website and buy. And that's why it's good to be everywhere, but at the same token, make sure you uh, see where that stuff is coming from. Right. Another good saying was, if you can't measure the results of something, a goal, if you set a goal of, of which you can't measure results, there's no point of achieving that goal. You guys know who said that? You did. You. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. I learned fast. <laughs> so, there you, so, there you go. so that's what, that's one of the things that uh, you really want to keep track of. There's no If you're going to spend time, effort, and money on marketing across multiple platforms, make sure you're measuring those results. Right. Awesome. So what are your top three tips for creating compelling YouTube videos? Be yourself, number one. Uh, know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is king. Mm -hmm. Don't get on camera or on a podcast. doesn't really matter what, where you're broadcasting. And just start talking nonsense. If you don't know the topic, it's okay to tell your audience that you don't right. really know about right. it. I get questions sometimes I don't know the answer to. And I flat out tell the audience, I don't really have experience with that particular watch or that brand. And what I'm telling you now is based on what I learned from a blog post. I often mention various blogs that I read. If I don't know something, I'll go out there and read it from a credible source. But mm -hmm. be honest, be yourself, and uh, be confident, I guess, is the, is, is the key. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be camera shy and nervous, it's not going to fly. Right. Yeah. right. People, people will see right through that. But to your totally. point, I mean, you can do multiple takes. It's just a matter of you, you have a great team behind you, obviously, that helps you edit the content and make sure that it's produced to a high level, which I think is also important. But, um, but you can take multiple takes. So if you're a little nervous the first few times and it does take a while right god forbid those people who go back and listen to yeah. my first few episodes they yeah. were they go, were rough go, around go look the at edges. my first few episodes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah you can take a few a few takes and kind of get yourself acclimated right exactly it's mm -hmm. it's a matter of uh, i have a buddy of mine who's actually starting out a new business as well and i told him about the three c's and i said uh, mike i said uh, you got to get on camera He's like, I'm not comfortable on camera. And this is a guy who's well-spoken. He's, he's well-educated. Uh, when you speak with him, you can talk to him about any topics, politics, finance, or whatever it may be. He comes off extremely intelligent because he is. Mm -hmm. The minute you put a camera in front of him, he freezes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm like, yep. well, I have a, I have a uh, tip for you. He's like, well, what do I do? I said, every morning, when you get up in the morning, make it a routine. Take your iPhone and talk into your iPhone. That's talk about your day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you talk about. That You're going to throw this footage out. But get comfortable talking into a camera. And I can't tell you that I was as comfortable in the very first video as I am today. You right. get more comfortable as it comes along. But mm -hmm. the reason that happens is because eventually you grow a community around yourself. People that you know by their name, really, but handle. People that you interact with on a daily basis via comments and the questions they submit. Yep. And then it just becomes a question of being comfortable, of walking into a room of people and talking to people that you already know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice in general, I think, because you're building a habit. That's brilliant. Uh, I've mm -hmm. never heard it shaped that way. You mm -hmm. were the guy who said it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's me. That's and, right. <laughs> and uh, it, is, it is a really smart way to develop that sort of habit and to develop a callus for seeing and hearing yourself, too, because same thing. When, when uh, Ryan helps edit behind the scenes a lot of the content that we produce, but every once in a while I'll jump in and do some editing or I'll listen to an episode after he's done editing it, and it's tough to hear yourself and to, hmm. see, and to see yourself on video right you know, at ask first. My, ask my guy, Ian, how many times he sees me a day. <laughs> <laughs> he's seen you in his dreams and nightmares too, right? I'm sure. <laughs> so to, to that end, though, once you've developed that video content, what are your, say, top three tips for building a following? Because you've done an amazing job. Your content's very highly produced, I think. There's a, a ton of production value. You care about quality, yes. clearly. But aside from quality and producing a high-quality product, how do you build, what are your top three pieces of advice for building a significant following? To build a significant following on YouTube specifically is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, there's guys that go out there and they uh, do things like giveaways and they do things like, uh, oh, uh, you know, follow, subscribe, this and that, and I'll enter you into a drawing or something like that. I'll give you a free T-shirt. I, right. I do none of that. Mm -hmm. 
The only giveaway I ever did on my channel is when I gave away a watch to a veteran just because I felt that he deserved it. That's awesome. That was, and that nice. was not for subscription views or anything for that matter. Uh, I feel like by doing giveaways and contests and things of that nature, specifically for YouTube, you end up with a bigger following, but it's not what I call quality following. What I'm looking right. for is for people to follow me that are into what I'm talking about, that mm -hmm. are into watches and not just there to get free stuff like mm -hmm. mugs, T-shirts and hats, et cetera. Right. Right. So it makes that makes it a lot more difficult. Uh, the way I initially grew my Instagram, uh, not Instagram, my YouTube channel mm -hmm. was by utilizing my existing follower on Instagram. But believe it or not, from 40,000 followers on Instagram or 40 plus, it gave me a approximately 500 followers from there. Wow. If you can find a way to establish a base, let's face it, everybody has some sort of a social media account, whether it's your Facebook, where your, all your friends are and so on and so forth. Start with a base, no matter how small that base is. And my, my base, I think, was 488 followers the minute I got on YouTube and I spread it on my Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be a lot more, but no. It's getting an Instagram, uh, YouTube followers is a lot difficult. you got to sign into your Gmail account and blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. people just watch it on, off of Facebook, off of a link, and they never subscribe. Right. Mm -hmm. I did subscribe to your channel. Oh, all right, me. awesome. <laughs> you got to subscribe to I, I got you. I got you. Don't worry. All right. So once I got the base following of, let's say, approximately 500 followers, that's when that creative content consistently comes in. Because when people get used to putting something out, I put a show out every Tuesday and every Thursday and some in between some travel vlogs and so on and so forth. This will be a, a nice video, too. Yeah, nice. Uh, but start with that base. Come out with compelling creative content to where people can't wait to come back and see you. And eventually, it's only a matter of time until you get mentioned. Uh, you get mentioned uh, by your viewers through their friends, through other social media platforms, and it grows and it grows slowly. Once it gets to a certain point, it starts to pick up speed. Yep. And look for the one viral video. That's really it. You know that There's always that one video that's going to take you to the next level when you end up featuring on the YouTube uh, homepage or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's just hard work, and it takes a while. It took me a year to get to 10,000, you know? Mm -hmm. But I would still rather do it that way organically, getting the viewership that I want, rather than giving away a watch and getting 10,000 followers that may not ever come back and watch my videos. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that's, to your credit, that's a brilliant marketing point, right? And it's kind of a new trend, even with micro-influencers now, rather than these quote-unquote influencers who may have a million followers and you're paying them to mention your product or your website or whatever, but at the end of the day, if their million followers aren't your target audience mm -hmm. it's you've just you might as well light that money on fire micro influencers <laughs> is something that me and i've been discussing over the last couple of months the hardest part about uh, getting them is uh, getting quality micro influencers yeah. actually mm -hmm. checking yeah. their following and there are plenty of agencies out there that claim that they can help you with that but yeah. for the most part it ends up being a waste of money you really mm -hmm. have to get out there and find them on your own and build a team yourself of those yeah. micro influencers yeah. that you mentioned because they do work. Mike and I actually have a colleague that we can introduce you to. That's a Brianna Spasado of In Between Rivers, and that's what she does. She builds influencer campaigns, and a lot of the time she does use micro influencers. Mm -hmm. The three of us as professionals in sort of the media and marketing industry, despite being a lawyer. I, uh, uh, did you hear that? <laughs> you, need you need to talk to her. <laughs> yeah, I can make the introduction. It'd be great. Brianna's awesome too. You she is her. awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's, you're right, that micro-influencers are much more important nowadays than uh, than these macro-influencers, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. So you've now started a Roman Sharf ch uh, YouTube channel. Um, Just trying to, sh sorry, oh, I'm sorry, quick interruption. Yeah. You know them? He did a photo shoot. Ah, that's oh, funny. Wow. Wait, so so Get Brianna out. did your photo shoot? Yeah. Oh, which, that's great. Which photo shoot? On the rooftop pool. Oh yeah, I remember that. I got a heat stroke that day. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good memory. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it was. He's smiling. So he's, uh, he's gonna see Brianna again. He's gonna be like, oh. My <laughs> that's funny. Small world, man. Well, we'll reconnect. We'll reconnect. If you there guys, you uh, if you guys are are disconnected, we'll reconnect. Okay, so you've now started a Roman Sharf channel on YouTube with your personal story, more collabs with your industry experts, and more engaging content. Why did you decide to start this new channel, especially with your Luxury Bazaar channel doing so well? Well, the Luxury Bazaar channel is contrary to not doing all that well uh, because company channels are very hard to take off. And uh, we took a different direction with the Luxury Bazaar channel that barely has any followers. And that is we realized that you cannot put the type of creative content unless there's a person behind it. Whenever you put up creative content with product behind it or a company behind it that sells a particular product, people are not engaged enough to look at product videos. So the way we decided to engage them via our 
company channel going forward over the next six months to a year is to pump enough content on there for it to simply become a video reference library. So that's the approach we're taking with the Luxury Bazaar channel. Of course, it doesn't really take anything away from us because every time we shoot a product and we shoot a product video that goes on our website, it also goes onto our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. But pretty soon, and you've been out there shopping for a watch or a piece of jewelry, they want to get a quick video to see what that looks like. There's not a whole lot. I mean, there's a lot of video out on the internet, but there's not a whole lot organized libraries for say. So this is what we're doing there. The idea behind the Roman Sharp channel is it's my, it's me. I'm the one talking as the founder and CEO of Luxury Bazaar. Mm -hmm. If you watch a lot of my videos, there's not there's never almost any uh, points to, oh, you know, go buy a watch on my website or, you know, this is all about Luxury Bazaar. It's not. It's all about me. And it sounds mm -hmm. kind of bad, I guess, if you ask me. But for the most part, that was the idea behind it is to sell myself and to be the face of the company, to be a true face, not an actor. I am the guy that's founded this company almost 18 years now mm -hmm. ago, and uh, I'm the guy that still runs it till this day. I'm still the CEO. I make all decisions, and everything that you see out there is based on my decision and the work of, and the hard work of my team, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same token, it gave me an opportunity to show the world, for say, or to show my clientele a different side of the business, right. to show the inner workings of the wholesale side of our business, which is huge, mm -hmm. to show the inner workings of uh, you know the day-to-day. And we're getting there. Abi, who's behind me right now, is going to be nodding his head. You know, he wants <laughs> he wants more. He wants to show the day to day, but it's very difficult to do so. As is, this probably takes away four to six hours of my time on a weekly basis. Right. Mm -hmm. And if this is all I was doing, then great. I would certainly we can definitely have a show. You know, I have guys in here pitching me for a show. Abi wants to make a show called Gray Market. You know, and be on Bravo or somewhere. I don't know. But hey, uh, we could talk about that offline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, you know, you still have to balance. You know, I still have a company to run. There's only so much content I could put out myself. Mm -hmm. Right. But the main thing is that uh, it was the, being the face behind the company, a true face behind the company, rather than an actor or somebody that is, let's say, not the boss or the CEO. Right. And I'm also most knowledgeable here in regards to what we do and the product that we sell. So mm -hmm. yeah. it just was a good fit. That always shines through, though. I feel like when it's when it's legit. No. It really is the person, you know it, you know, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. In, in the world we live in now, personal branding is huge, right? I mean, we live in a, a Gary V and Roman Scharf world. So uh, <laughs> guys guys like you, you know, Gary V with like Vayner Media, you with Luxury Bazaar, um, then you go out and you have your accounts where it's literally you. And it still ties back to your products and services of and course. all of those things. But quite frankly... It it presents you in a more personal way to your target audience, and I think that's what builds the connection to your point. We live in a world where product marketing is becoming extremely expensive, ineffective, and difficult to do yeah. because of the competition that's out there. Right. Uh, and uh, we recently revamp our marketing efforts to gear more towards brand recognition than anything else. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if you can sell yourself and you can sell your brand, then the product sales will follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rather than uh, competing with people for pay-per-click money on certain products that others sell or uh, try to compete for position, you're better off branding yourself. Mm -hmm. Everybody remember, remembers, hey, Mike, it's hump day, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody exactly. knows that of commercial. Course. And yeah. everybody yeah. was blown away by the Dollar Shave Club commercial, which yeah. we're actually trying to create something better. Yeah. You think we'll do it? I've <laughs> but, uh, Look forward to seeing but that. At, the, at the end of the day it's 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 really uh you're better off branding yourself and mm -hmm. by yourself i don't mean an individual but yourself and the company yeah. itself it's i feel it's a better approach nowadays because yeah. the pay-per-click market is just so polluted no yeah. one likes the hard sell anymore right i mean people like to they like to buy something after they you know they're into whatever they're they're buying, right? Like like you, for example. Like people get into you, they're like, oh, this guy's great, da da da. You know what? When I buy a watch, I'm gonna buy from him. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and that's exactly that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's still the good old trick. You, the consumer is still getting educated by watching a video, by watching it could be uh, we're huge on blog posts. Yeah. Our blog posts, right. if you read a lot of our blogs, they're actually interesting to read. Mm -hmm. Where a majority of blog posts that you get out there and see, they're created for the fact that they want to bring links back to your website. Right. They want to have SEO right. juice, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And and all you read is an article that's filled with SEO keywords. It's not interesting to read. Right. We try to do it otherwise. And recently we started converting the, uh, the blogs that we write into a quick, short video synopsis so to speak Smart. that tells yeah. you about that again yeah. people want to they want instant gratification that is they want to mm. look at it, your post see a video let it get engaged in the first three seconds otherwise they yeah. scroll down or whatever yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're right it's so much easier to to engage with it's much more palatable that way 
It's just quicker, it's faster, it's more effective. They see you, they see the products, your videos, you know, when you're doing your your watch reviews and you're showing people the physical watch, they get to kind of see it, you know, exactly. in action. Think of uh, scrolling through Instagram nowadays. Yeah. How many times have you stopped at an ad that was a picture versus when it was a video? I almost stop at every other video ad that yep. that's on my feed because it's it engages you immediately. Right. Where a picture, unless it's a pretty picture, and at the end of the day, the only pictures I think that are still engaging is skin. I mean, yeah. if it's a pretty girl or pretty guy on there with a product, you get engaged. Everything else, you tend to sort of scroll through. Yep. Mm -hmm. Luxury is another one. So Actually, we're you're right. Thinking of that. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. Think, about, think about it. Scroll right. through, throw, yeah. throw through yeah. Instagram. You know, totally. the, every other post is yeah. now uh, an ad, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is why a lot of people are hating it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but at the end of the day, what engages you? If there's a cool video, the first three seconds engage you, mm -hmm. and you're right there, and you're watching that video ad, yeah. and then the impulse buys come in. I bought a lot of useless crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. I mean, we're sitting in your office, and by the way, thank you for hosting us. No problem. But we're mm -hmm. sitting here at, at Luxury Bazaar HQ, in your office, and you have amazing stuff here. I mean, you have, that's the, you were saying the Americans World War II spy camera yes, behind it's you. Yes, it's an aerial camera, actually. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. From a World War II plane, right next to is its Russian counterpart. I like cool, old mechanical things, and I felt like uh, my office is, could be a conversation all on its own. Yeah, it is, <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool space. And, yeah. and then just all the watch swag everywhere is, mm -hmm. uh, have to. You know, makes you drool a little bit. Comes with the territory, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. really cool. Yeah, well, again, thank you for hosting us. This mm -hmm. was amazing, and thank you for the information. I think you 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 amazingly packed a lot of really cool info into a very compact amount of time. Uh, just really quickly, though, to wrap up, we're going to play a little game that we play called First, Last, Best, and Worst. We'll throw a category at us, at you. You give us the first one, the last one, the best one, and the worst one that you've experienced. Quick question. Is there some kind of game show intro music to this or no? No. We'll work on that. We'll work on that. Actually, I'm just going to use your recording now. From <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here we go. So how about your first, last, best, and worst entrepreneurial moment? My first best entrepreneurial moment is the time where I decided to leave my huge corporate career and get into the business and work for my own for the first time ever. Hmm. My, then it was the, my best, my, my best entrepreneurial moment, uh, was when I get into wholesale, realizing that you cannot do retail alone and how much wholesale side of any business, regardless of what you're selling, wow. could, uh, boost up your sales and the wheel of finances that are rolling alongside with it. Interesting. And my last best... Your most recent? My most recent uh, inter best entrepreneurial moment is probably uh, opening up an office in HK. Uh, I think that was a good move. Um, wow. We have been doing wholesale and, uh, and some retail out in HK for quite some time. And uh, opening up an office out there was a huge plus logistically, financially, and business-wise for us. Does that facilitate Excellent. things for you from a, like a tariff and... and what it, what it does, we do, we do uh, three major trade shows in Hong Kong per year, hence my Hong Kong blogs. Check those out. They're mm -hmm. pretty fun. But uh, having an individual there full time, having their pulse on the market that's completely different from mm -hmm. that of the United States market and European market, sort of that other side of the world. So well, Hong Kong, that would probably encompass the Middle East just as well and mainly nice. in China, which is a huge drive to any business nowadays. Oh, yeah. It's too bad what's going on in Hong Kong today. Hopefully that all gets fixed because I have to be there in September. But uh, mm. um, that was probably a really good move and most recent. It's fantastic. How about your awesome. worst entrepreneurial moment? My worst entrepreneurial moment, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it entrepreneurial. It was when uh, I was uh, talking to a client. When I very first started, he asked me about a particular watch and the watch was a Turbion. Uh, for you watch guys that don't know what a Turbion is, it's uh, created by Louis Bourget uh, 150 some years ago. It's supposed to adjust your mainspring of your watch to the effect that gravity has on your watch. He made it for a pocket watch for the queen that kept complaining. Her pocket watch was running slow. Of course, I didn't know that at the time when the client called in, and it happened to be a very knowledgeable client. And when he asked me what a Turbion is, and I answered him, and my exact words, well, there's sort of another movement within the movement, and it's just like a window to the movement, and which was the worst answer I've ever given. <laughs> and I knew the guy, I, the guy didn't call me out on it, but I knew that he knew he never ended up buying a watch from me. And I, right. for some reason, 
17 some years later, I still remember that moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always remember the bad beats, right? Yeah. I mean, the lesson haunts, there, don't, 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 the lesson there is don't talk out of your ass, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, that's, and that's the lesson I learned there. And I, ever since then, I stopped. I would just say, I don't know. Yeah. Did that influence you for your YouTube videos now, right? Did that uh, moment? It does. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I always, re I always yeah. remember that story. And it always reminds me again not to talk out of my ass. That's really, that's really what it comes down to. Wow. Wow. Cool. Okay. So your first, last, best, and worst watch sales. Uh, my first best watch sale, uh, and again, I won't mention any names, but I sold a watch to a gentleman who is, uh, at the time, he was number 646 on the Forbes list. Uh, the guy at the time, this was, we're going back about maybe 12 years or so, and uh, again, without giving away too much private information, I, I walked into a house that's worth $51 million. Hmm. I uh, sold a half a million dollar to a gentleman who wrote me a check as if he was writing his electricity bill. <laughs> but what struck me about that particular sale wasn't the fact that it was the first most expensive watch I've sold. And I've sold watches more expensive than I've sold. I've sold a watch for $2 million. I've sold a watch for a million wow. and a half multiple sure. times over. But what struck me about this particular gentleman is how he greeted and how humble he was. And I think awesome. the biggest lesson there was is to stay humble, which is extremely difficult when you come from dirt and nothing. And when you finally make something yourself, staying humble is probably one of the most difficult things to learn along the way. Mm -hmm. And that was the guy that uh, taught me that lesson along with me selling him a half a million dollar watch. That's awesome. awesome. How about your most recent mm -hmm. last watch sale? My most recent last That watch. jumps out at you. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. literally a watch that you sold 10 minutes ago on, on, on the website. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's tough considering we move hundreds of pieces uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, Something that's. I'll tell out you what. At the yeah. last Hong Kong show, I made a bet. Uh, a guy came around the booth that uh, comes around often, and he's always uh, not. Uh, he's always a uh, what do they call him? Uh, uh, tire kicking. Tire kicking. Thank yeah. you. That's mm -hmm. the word I was looking. He's one of those tire kickers, and uh, the guys made a bet with me. Uh, if you sell him a watch, uh, you know we'll do all the packing and unpacking for the show every day. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to help. You can just stand back and watch and laugh at us, right? Nice. Took me three and a half days. I sold him what him a watch <laughs> and. Uh, his wife a watch and uh, wow. I, the, to me it was more of a challenge I still consider myself to be the sales best salesperson in here even though I don't do sales often and it was sort That's of awesome. a you know I shoved it in my salespeople's face to say <laughs> I'm still the best seller I, not only did I sell him a watch I sold his wife a watch as well and uh, he keeps coming back for more so love it huge that's great Nice. Yeah. Do you have any advice? How did you turn that client around? You don't have to give us the specifics of that. Particular Believe it or not, it, there's a different approach to every single client. When it comes to sales, there's lots of tips and tricks, and that could be a whole different podcast. <laughs> but most will say, be patient, listen to the client, and so on and so forth. That's a bunch of bull. You have to be able to read the client. And believe it or not, what I read from that client is that I need to make him feel less important as if I don't care. Uh -huh. And that was the, it was, it was the hard to get approach, I guess, call it that yeah, way. And I, right. I made him feel very unimportant as if I don't need his business. Mm -hmm. And I don't normally do that with my clients. I mm -hmm. make all my clients feel important. But in that particular situation, this is where I felt the technique was needed because at that point it was a bet and I needed to make that sale. So I knew that this is what it's <laughs> going to take. And that's what I did. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. Challenge accepted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how about your best watch sale ever? The one, the one that really stands out. We heard the worst one already, so you mm -hmm. won't have to get that one. It was the first Sky Monterbi and Patek Philippe that I sold for one, $1,650,000. Wow. And what made that special is that client came back for a second, and I was able to source it. Those watches are impossible to find. Wow. Uh, put it in perspective, it was, at the time it was sold approximately $500,000 over its list value. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's the most, at the time, it was the most complicated watch in the world. So uh, that was it. It doesn't get any better. If you think of cars, you think, let's say, Bugatti is it when it comes to, you know, fancy cars. That was it. That was the Bugatti of the watch world at the time. And there's, if you ask 100 dealers in the room, uh, you know, 80 of them has probably never held that watch in their hand. And the best part about that particular watch is at my house, I still have, I kept the pusher that it comes with. Hopefully my client is not listening. It comes with a very <laughs> fancy pusher. It comes with a very fancy pusher, and what I did is I replaced that pusher with a more plain one, still from Patek Philippe, but not one that comes with it. And I still have that pusher, and I wear it as a necklace sometimes as a reminder. Wow. Uh, I could cool. see the importance of that, though. Yeah. It wasn't like you, were, you, you weren't doing anything per se sneaky there. You were no. doing it because it was just it a stood, memento. It you know, stood for something. Exactly. Yeah. No bait cool. switch. Yeah. yeah. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So how about, you know... Um, you are the quintessential American dream story. 
You came here when you were 13, right? In 1988. That's right. See, I pay attention to details. We were just having some ice cream (laughs) cake and I picked up the info. I was just there for recon, really. (laughs) And um, and so you came over in 1988. Your dad had four bucks in his pocket. Um, Quintessential American dream story coming to this country, starting a business. I mean, even just getting to the Fortune 500 company, working for Deutsche Bank and then... um, and then, you know, now developing your own business and not only developing your own business, but blowing it up to the degree that you've gotten to. How about your first, last, best and worst American dream moments? Well, I, I obviously, the first and best is obviously coming here. If you could imagine a young kid coming over from Soviet Union, uh, we barely had any toilet paper, three TV channels. One of them was in Ukraine, which I could not understand, and uh, nothing on the shelves in any given store. Right. And to come into New York City and to see the bright lights, uh, to walk into a supermarket and to see all that, all of a sudden, it literally brought tears to people's eyes, myself wow. included. So coming to America is going to be the best moment, always will be the most memorable. I guess the worst moment is the fact that when I grew up and I realized that uh, my father would never get uh, to a level that I could potentially get to or his children could, and that what he did is he spent the last of his years working, working hard to ensure that we have a better future, that was probably a bit sad, yeah. but it's not sad anymore because my dad now lives comfortably thanks to me and he doesn't have to, doesn't have a worry in the world, right? That's awesome. So the worst moment is actually realizing that my father could never reach the potential that I could and which made me work even harder not to waste that. That's probably it. And uh-huh. what was the other one? I think we should just end on that. Yeah. That was so yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. <laughs> That's awesome. Roman, yeah. thank you so much for your time. How can people uh, find you, find you on YouTube? What are your handles? What's the easiest way to get The easiest way to find me is my YouTube channel is my name. It's Roman Scharf, and my website is luxurybazaar.com, which you can probably find it on my YouTube channel just the same. Awesome. And we'll definitely cool. post links to everything in the show notes for exactly. this. Exactly. And I will, we'll wrap up this video. I'm sure Ian will have a fancy cut for this. What kind <laughs> of an outro would you like, Ian? <laughs> he wants it doesn't matter to me outro so all right i'm gonna, I'm gonna play our outro music and we'll, we'll close it out like that and we'll post it to the video as well all right all thanks right. a lot roman all mike right. thanks for co-hosting Absolutely. this was awesome Always. guys thank you very much thank you roman. you're listening to an all-new episode of self-made strategies visit selfmadestrategies.com for new episodes information about our guests and a whole lot more If you're listening on iTunes or Google Play, please go to our show page and leave a review.